So thanks for joining us uh, for this session, choosing to be at this session. Uh, we, yeah, we'll put the slide back up at the end so you can get names and emails. Um, so we were asked by the EarthRanger team to just do this panel session uh, to introduce wildlife veterinary in the conservation sphere. Um, it's so much more than just treating sick animals uh, or translocating animals, as you'll hear today. You know, it's, uh, it plays a really important part, I think, in, in, the, in the greater scheme of, of conservation. So that's what the whole idea of this session is today, is just to introduce you to, to things which are going on in the field and, and new ideas that are emerging, uh, and basically how it could be applicable to, to you guys working um, wherever you're working within the conservation sphere. Uh, just to start by introducing myself, um, and then I'll introduce the panelists. But, uh, my name is Kieran Avery. Um, I've been working in northern Kenya with communities in community conservation since 2016. Um, I was born and raised in Kenya and trained as a vet in the UK and always had a passion to go back to, to home and, and work in the conservation landscape. Um, my career back there started looking at livestock demographics because the communities of northern Kenya are all pastoralists uh, and trying to see whether genetics could be improved and also alongside wildlife, you know, whether we could make sort of more efficient use of the rangelands. Um, but it very quickly became apparent that the rangelands are just so degraded uh, that it's impossible to improve genetics with, you know, with no grass. So, so my role emerged to, uh, to, sorry, evolved to one of natural resource management, um, and now it's actually working in, in carbon. So it's, uh, it's very different. Uh, and I'm, I'm doing a talk on Saturday morning if, you know, if you want to understand the sort of carbon uh, revenue and conservation space, um, which is really emerging as well. Uh, but yeah, my role now is really just looking at uh, the bigger picture, how things interact with each other, wildlife people, um, and their livestock. Um, we've got three panelists today. Uh, Steve is going to be focusing on the sort of practical translocation, um, immobility side. Fran, uh, likewise, but Fran brings the sort of science and research base to this, um, having done a lot of uh, research into animal welfare and sort of what happens to animals when you actually immobilize them. And then Shaleen will be looking at this emerging topic of One Health, which I'm sure you guys have heard about, which is obviously very topical uh, in, in a world where human population is increasing uh, and pressure on natural resources is driving all sorts of pressures between people and, and, and uh, wildlife. So yeah, so how we'll do this, uh, they'll each give you guys a sort of a five minute talk on what they do, um, and then we'll have a question and answer session to keep it, as I say, very interactive. So Steve, over to you. Good. Good morning. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Karen. So you did a bit of introduction. My name is Steven Chege, and I've been, uh, I'm a wildlife veterinarian. And I've been, I used to work with the Kenya Wildlife Service. That's when I started my career. And before I even introduce myself, I, want, I, I like knowing my audience. How many this side are veterinarians? This is good. Yes. And uh, ecologists? Thank you. And what about the managers? Good. So this is actually very well balanced. So we try to make sure that uh, we will not be boring you with a lot of veterinary stuff. But before you all sat down, there was a picture that was being projected here. How many of you saw it? Good. And I had not even intended to talk about that picture. But when I came here, that's actually how the life of a wildlife veterinarian is. Because uh, it's not once that you'd be called in to go and rescue those kind of animals. And who is the first person to see that? It's actually the ranger. So in our talk today, I think we'll be emphasizing more of uh, how we need to work together, because that is important. Uh, Karen already mentioned that uh, don't see that veterinarian is all, only there to do the injections. I think there's more than that, and especially when you're dealing with the conservation. So it's a huge, huge, huge thing. So again, going back to my introduction, Stephen Chege, I've been working with the Kenya Wildlife Service, then uh, as a field uh, veterinarian based in uh, northern Kenya. Then I moved on and decided to work in the zoo. I wanted just to be sure that whatever people do in the zoo, whether it's, there's any relationship with uh, the free-ranging staff. And I was working in Abu Dhabi for seven years before I decided also, let me go back home and continue the other phase. So I'll, I'll be trying to share my experiences and what I have seen. And uh, currently, I'm working with the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, supporting or managing the conservation programs. And we have uh, three key programs in Kenya, at least uh, that is San Diego Zoo. Talking about the giraffe program, we have the leopard program, and the rhinos, which mainly 
that will be introduced in the, one of the conservancies in Lake Kipia. So our teams are, are actually doing a great deal. Other than that, San Diego Zoo supports other conservation programs in the country, that is in Kenya and many other countries, but I'm more focused on the Kenya. Good, and because it's not about San Diego, let me come to the topic and talk about what do I do and what I think is of conservation value. Like, uh, I get involved in many aspects and for that period of time, but more importantly, I would like us to look at uh, translocations. And translocations have been done many years. We have had successes. We have had areas whereby at least uh, things have not gone very well. And I think it would be good if we bring them up today and really look at what is it that we can do better. So why do people do the translocation or move that animal from wherever it is to a different area? There could be many reasons. Could be maybe you want to reintroduce a species to an area that it was already existing. So it's important to know, first of all, why did those animals then they get extinct or whatever happened? Try to find out, and that thing comes out very strongly. But unfortunately, sometimes we ignore those basics. Yes, you might, people also want to do things also like translocation sometimes for tourism or to boost the numbers, and all that is important. But because I'm not an ecologist, and I have worked with ecologists, and I've, they have taught me so many things from those ecological perspectives. I wanted to go into the, the veterinary perspectives and the considerations. Yes, it's when, and we say that when you're moving that animal, it's not just uh, one single individual or the elephant or the rhino, whatever it is. Remember, it's a package. And when you're looking at diseases, we have had issues where diseases become a challenge. Is it because something was not done right or you didn't know about it? But luckily, people have come up together and come up with uh, things like uh, veterinary guidelines. What is it that we are supposed to be looking at? So, and when I'll, I'll be discussing, I'll also give you a few examples of where things have gone wrong. And hopefully now in hindsight, we think that would have done them in a different way. Yes, so, so during the translocation, again, you must understand the goal. Why do you want to do it? Which area? And you know, you do all those kind of assessments. And now for the disease risk assessment, so if you're putting, getting your animals from point A to the B, what diseases are there? Some of the times actually, I think we waste a lot of opportunities because animals get immobilized or things are happening and that will be challenging all of you and asking you how you can help us actually collect the data. But we end up not knowing really what is happening? So what was the cause of death? What did the animals die of? Most of the times it's actually not very sure. When I look at the, most of the data that we collect for wildlife conservation, you find that even the mortalities, for example, there are so many, a bigger percentage of the dead animals which are being clumped as a cause of death is unknown or natural. So sometimes we put it there and I think I'm just trying to provoke you so that we start thinking, and most of the times, you know, you ask the vet, why did the animals die? I also don't know, because I wasn't there, I didn't collect the data. But what is it that we can do, all of us together, to be able actually to make sure that we capture that? So with that disease risk assessment, it's important to know the source, or where the animals are coming from and where you're taking them from. Yes, you may not go there and dart all the animals and try to find out what diseases they have, because anyway, anything invasive sometimes is not even uh, very, oh, it's, I don't think it's a good welfare thing. But you can ask yourself, in that area, what other species or related species, maybe like uh, the, the, the livestock, what diseases do they carry? And again, this gives you that collaboration with the other sector. I introduced myself as a wildlife veterinarian. And I don't think, there's nothing like a wildlife veterinarian. I think we are all veterinarians, the people who are working in livestock and for us in a, a domestic. But sometimes you seem not to be working very closely. So you don't even get to know what is happening with the livestock. And yet, so you also not understand what is happening within your, uh, the, the wildlife species. And it becomes so difficult. You have to wait until then it dies. Then you can be able to try to find out what it is. So I think that is the important thing to do. That is before the translocation. Get to understand what diseases are in that area. What are the kind of mitigation measures that you can actually do to make sure that at least 
before you taking the animals there, are there any risks? Are you going to, is there a way of uh, mitigating that? So that has to be considered well in advance. And so how do you go about that? Yes, you doing with the livestock. Most of you ecologists, the veterinarians, they have been immobilizing animals for many years. If you are cave samples, I think that is also a very good avenue whereby at least you can be able to say, okay, we think, for example, trypanosomiasis could be a risk to these new animals. Do the animals, uh, does trypanosomiasis occur in your region or where the animals are coming from? At least you can either use the livestock data or even retrospective samples that you have been uh, banking all along. And then coming to the actual translocation, again, you see, that's also another aspect. And welfare comes in uh, very strongly, and I'm sure most of you have been involved in uh, translocations. When you're talking about the, the effects of uh, drugs, and my colleague uh, Francisca will be talking about how even we measure that, getting to know, when you mobilize that animal, is the animal really like uh, being its best or you're just compromising its health here without really knowing it? So welfare comes in actually very strongly. So other things that come in and you'll always see is uh, issues like uh, the injuries. Again, when you're talking about the eco ecologists, you work with the animals, you understand them very well. But I have seen sometimes this big gap between the veterinarians and the ecologists. So you have been studying these animals, you understand their behavior. I'm not saying that we don't do, but I think you're better placed. And then I come in and I want to jump in and do everything. Yes, and you forget that uh, if you compromise or you don't understand their behavior, then you might end up causing many problems. So I think, again, as we are talking about all this, what are the emphasis? How can we really work together? Because the end result is actually that species or the population. That is all what we are looking at, not really the different uh, discipline that we are looking at. So how do we minimize uh, those injuries? Do you understand the animal behavior? I think it's key, and these are all the considerations that uh, we make. And I had mentioned that I wanted to just give maybe two examples of uh, where things have gone wrong in the past and things that we can learn from. Uh, how many of you know the mountain bongo? Antelope, good. So this is good. So that's a critically endangered uh, species, and we, in Kenya, had them many years ago, and in the 1970s, 80s, some were taken to Europe and North America, and uh, early in the year 2000, there was a program actually to reintroduce them back into Africa, or into Kenya for this case. And uh, some of the, I think there were 18 individuals that were being taken up from the, from the that was from North America, they came into Kenya, but you'd be surprised that, uh, so these animals actually, there was a huge mortality due to tick-borne infection. Uh, if you think about tick-borne infection, for example, that problem is called uh, terraria, terrariosis. It's very common in Kenya. And I'll tell you that even a new graduate in vet, uh, from vet school will be able to diagnose it very fast. But all of us were hit. Why do you think the case? So these animals, Okay, originally they came from Kenya. So it was the descendants of the descendants that actually were repatriated from America into Kenya. I don't think uh, there was any tick challenge in that area. So they were already very naive. So they come back to Kenya. We have, we have full of ticks everywhere and the forests that were re being reintroduced to. So the animals were actually didn't have that immunity and came down with that. We didn't even do immediate... Uh, diagnostics, but at least luckily you can be able to do it through clinical science or even microscopy. But later on, it was actually not until very late that it was confirmed through molecular analysis that that was actually the terraria of tick-borne infection that killed them. I know now we have uh, plans to bring in more and even other countries, not only that. So how prepared are we? When you're talking about uh, how we manage these animals in uh, captivity and the free ranging, how possible is it? So like the challenges that we face, for example, tick control. In Kenya, the livestock people, and I'm sure it's the same in other countries, you have to dip your animals after every, or spray them after every seven days. How practical is that with the free-ranging antelopes? 
that may not be very possible, right? So what do you do? And the, the source of these animals, they are already naive. They, are not, they have not been exposed to the tick challenge. So you know that that's a challenge that is coming up. You may not really have, be having all the ideas, but I think when you all work as one team, I think ideas, that's how people come up with, with ideas and be able to solve these problems. And not waiting until the last minute when things have gone wrong and we're all fighting each other. I think that is important to mention. There is something that I forgot, but I have remembered. When we are doing all these uh, considerations and getting to know where these animals are getting to, habitat, including their food and water quality, I think we, all of us know the importance of water, but I think everybody has been thinking wildlife cancers, uh, they can live in any kind of water. And if you remember, Kenya was badly hit when we lost a number of black rhinos due to salt poisoning. Yes, it was a water quality issue. And how come we didn't catch that? Those are the questions. And what can we do better? So 20, 2001, 2020, sorry, 2021 or 2020, I can't remember the exact. We were moving some uh, elephants from uh, Reteti. Reteti is, uh, is a sanctuary that is mainly, they reha rescue, rehabilitate, and res release animals back into the wild. And everybody was very key and tight on the water quality. And I remember going to the literature I couldn't even find the baseline water values for the different species that we have. So that presents us with a very complex situation. Yes, you know that there was a problem with the water, but what is the right water quality for these species? Is it the same for livestock, the horses, the cattle? And when I was going to the literature, I realized how varied and how diverse this field that we are working in is. And going back to different other disciplines, they have been collecting this data for a long, long, long time. And today I was uh, one of the sessions. I think, uh, yeah, it's actually the opening ceremony. I think from uh, Earth Ranger and the SMART, becoming smarter and that integration, I think is important. Like we keep integrating all this kind of information that we do collect in our own small silos. How does it help to the well-being of these animals? Sometimes we talk about it when we're in meetings, but sometimes accessing that kind of data becomes almost uh, a big challenge. So that's why I'm emphasizing the need of working together. Maybe the other example that I can give, I'm doing One good? Minute. One minute. <laughs> Another example that I can give is, uh, now I can't remember the year, but it must have been around 2006, 2007. So we moved rhinos from different places in Kenya, took them to Meru National Park, Meru National Park is a high sensitive fly area, infect, infested area. And uh, we lost, I think, uh, three rhinos due to trypanosomiasis. And again, when we did some retrospective uh, work, we realized there are those that had come, only the ones that died or they got infected, they were coming only from one specific area. And coming down to it, we realized that place actually, we didn't have a sense of challenge. Again, animals which are naive, how come again we didn't catch that? It's very, it's something that is almost obvious. When I put it to everybody, it's an obvious thing. Why didn't you consider that? The reasoning, I think sometimes is uh, simple. There are times we really move things in a rush or in a hush and there's a lot of pressure from all different uh, parties because Remember, I started with the goal. I think that is the starting point. We must understand what is the goal? Why do you really want to do this translocation? And how do you do it well to make sure that at least you all achieve? So I was asked, I had 30 minutes, so one minute, but I'll save the 30 seconds and uh, leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> so yeah, next up will be Fran, who will, as I say, bring the science base. Um, Fran sort of pioneering a lot of the monitoring um, of wildlife when they're under sedation or, or tranquilization, whatever it is. So it'll be good to hear what she's learned over the last few years. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Francesca Vitali. I'm a wildlife veterinarian from Italy, but I've been around Kenya for uh, many years now. And uh, I'm at the moment leading um, 
a research project um, about implementing health monitoring during translocations. In particular, in particular, I'm piloting this in Eastern Black Rhinos. And this is a project fully sponsored by the National Geographic Society, but I work with the Smithsonian Institution um, in the US and with um, Kenyan organizations like KWS, WRTI, um, Ampala Research Center, and um, ILRI. So uh, before saying more about my project, I would like to thank Hurt Ranger uh, for thinking about wildlife veterinarians. I think <laughs> this is very important. Sometimes we are forgotten. Um, but I think this is a very good occasion to share insights and ideas and think about how also veterinarians can um, have a value in organizing conservation and in particular in translocation. I think this is very, very important. Um, so uh, my colleague Steven has been speaking very well about translocation, how things can go wrong um, very easily. Um, what I'm adding to that with my project is the welfare side uh, and the health monitoring. So very often um, translocation are not very well monitored. Um, reasons are many. Um, scientific literature about translocation is really scarce. I don't know why. I think they're so interesting. Uh, but when I was doing my PhD on um, wildlife capture, I realized uh, how interesting were translocation. And I was trying to understand more. It's like, yes, we mobilize wildlife, but what, what happened when, they, when we put them on a truck, we release them in a new environment? And I really couldn't find much. Um, I think my answer is that for studying anesthesia, uh, maybe you put together a couple of colleagues and you collect data that day, uh, then you go home, analyze, publish a paper. But for translocation is another story. You need a big team, a lot of planning, uh, many skills. You need to work with ecologists, biologists, and sometimes it's too much. Everyone is so busy on their daily life. Um, and who really has time to put together such a big project and correlate different aspects. Uh, so what we are doing, and I'm working a lot with my colleagues here and other colleagues, is um, we're doing a project that study translocations uh, from the beginning. So even before the capture, um, we have rangers um, observing the rhinos. Um, to the capture day, drugs, translocation protocols, transport. And then we are lucky enough to have, again, rangers that will monitor the rhinos and will report to us um, saying what's happening with their health, uh, observing them, and collecting fecal samples that then we can um, analyze for different things. Uh, my focus is on physiology, so I study the stress, acute stress, and chronic stress. And then my colleagues here, they're studying diseases, so then we will have data to combine uh, the incidence of diseases with chronic stress. And this is something quite new, again, because it's difficult to be organized. Um, but it's super important. And we also have an ecologist working with us, um, looking at the ecological point of view. Another aspect um, I'm working uh, on is that um, sometimes, again, it's not very easy to organize a, a full research project. Um, so we are uh, moving the first steps towards creating a module on Hurt Ranger for monitoring translocation health. And we hope that um, this will really speed up collection of information. Um, the idea is to have a module for the veterinarians to include information about the procedure and then a module for the rangers to include observation, um, incidence of disease and everything. Um, and then the last um, challenge we are trying to tackle is that if you look at the IUCN guidelines for translocations, there's mostly nothing about health monitoring. I think they say monitor mortalities or, um, yeah, disease risk analysis, of course, but I think monitoring mortality sometimes is too late. So what we want to do is to create an um, international committee of translocation experts from the animal health side in order to start to discuss uh, this um, lack of guidance and coming up with, uh, with guidelines on how to monitor and push uh, to include health monitoring in translocations all the time and not based on researchers' um, voluntar volu voluntarity. Um, last um, 
project we are starting. Actually, it's a this month project. Uh, we are exploring how to extend the health monitoring to marine animals. We had a workshop in Kenya last month, uh, the first workshop for uh, um, marine mammal uh, medicine. And we found a lot of interest from uh, coastal stakeholders to create a um, platform where to record normal sightings for species, but also stranding, entanglements, um, and mortalities. So this is what we're working on. And I'll pass the word to Shalin. <clears throat> Perfect. Thanks, Fran. So lastly, before questions, um, Shalene will talk about the, yeah, this, this sort of nexus of disease and zoonosis, which is obviously uh, up and coming. Thanks, Shalene. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you've heard, my name is Shalene Angwanyi. I am a feel weird saying wildlife vet because I'm not f fully in wildlife alone. Um, I think compared to the two of them, I'm sort of a bit more early career, so trying to figure out which direction I want to go. Um, Growing up, I always knew I wanted to do something to do with wildlife. So when I found out being a wildlife... Research Institute. So I'm sure you're hearing two different things, wildlife, livestock, which is sort of now my role and where everything I'm going to talk about comes in. Um, so as we've mentioned and everyone knows, zoonotic diseases are an increasing threat um, to health in general. So from animals, which talking about the domestic animal side of things, um, to humans as well. But what we've also realized is for wildlife, there's a lot of research that's not being done in terms of diseases. Um, so for example, in rhinos um, and all these other endangered species, a lot of efforts are going into protecting the animals and making sure you know poaching rates are down, we're fencing them in areas where um, there won't be a lot of poachers coming in and making sure that security-wise everything is sorted. But at the same time, all these management activities we're doing is also predisposing them to diseases. So for example, the translocations we're speaking about um, are sources of stress for these animals. And everyone knows when you're stressed out, your immunity drops and things that were probably okay before are now going to start affecting these animals. Um, things like um, Anthony mentioned in the morning during the keynote speak, um, speech, sorry, in creating transfrontier parks and having corridors between different conservation areas, we are also kind of really, if you look at it, um, creating channels for diseases to cross between areas that possibly have one sort of pathogen compared to others. So these are things that we need to actively think about, really. Um, and part of the many things I do, um, as Francesca has mentioned, is during these translocation processes, looking into, specifically for my project, is clostridial diseases, um, and trying to see in terms of climate change and also the rhinos themselves, because mine's on rhinos, eastern black rhinos in Kenya, um, what are the predisposing factors that, during these management activities, um, that are putting the animals at higher risk of developing clostridial diseases. And it's kind of just trying to see what can we put in place to stop being reactive when wildlife becomes sick. Because a lot of times we're just reacting to what's coming on and not really being proactive and trying to see what measures we can institute in place to make sure we prevent all these diseases. Um, going a bit more towards the One Health side of things, we have two projects that are currently ongoing. One sort of just completed. Um, we had one which was doing wildlife disease surveillance and one health mechanisms, um, response mechanisms, which basically we were going into different community and pastoral, pastoral community areas in Kenya and speaking to community members who are living with wildlife. Because a lot of times, again, we're focusing on the wildlife and not remembering everyone else who's living with animals. And we were trying to understand what do the communities see the risks of all these wildlife diseases are, and what their understanding of the wildlife diseases are, um, and what do they think measures 
which measures should be put in place to, inst to make sure that the diseases are not spreading from the wildlife to the livestock and to the human beings as well. And it was very interesting to see that all these community members who, to be perfectly honest, let's all say it, um, are quite disregarded in terms of all the conservation efforts we're putting and that the ones who should actually be on the front line. Um, and it was very interesting to see that they'd give us like 10, 20 diseases that they know they've seen in wildlife. And they will tell you, yeah, when we see um, a limping elephant, for example, we know not to go to that area because it's this disease and we'll change our, um, our travel routes and go to a different direction. So it was just very interesting that one, they knew the diseases that are affecting the wildlife. They knew the diseases that spread between the wildlife and the livestock. And they knew the diseases that affected them as well from the animals. And it's very interesting because, again, I think it's about 60% of pathogens that affect human beings actually have an animal origin. So if you think about that and think about, again, the people who are living with the wildlife are also significantly at risk of getting these diseases. So making sure, again, when we're coming up with all these management activities and everything um, that we're considering in moving animals and treating animals also, just ensuring that we are having that One Health um, approach in everything that we're doing. So if you're taking care of the wildlife, for example, in Kenya, some of our priorities, zoonotic diseases, we have anthrax, we have rabies, um, we have Rift Valley fever, and all of them, again, affect wildlife, affect livestock, affect the human beings. And when it comes to, again, to these rural communities, which, again, are marginalized most of the times, and they know these diseases, what are the efforts we need to put in place to make sure that we are, one, ensuring the health of the people, of course, but as they are with the wildlife, how can we use that knowledge that they have and the experience that they have to make sure that um, the disease surveillance efforts are being done effectively from that level and not that we're waiting for wildlife to die in mass for us to react um, or that the disease has now started affecting livestock and then we're like, oh, trade food safety, that's when the problems start becoming um, more serious to us. So yeah, so just trying to figure out um, how now we can create more opportunities for these different community members to ensure that we're having that One Health approach. Um, and in that, of course, as we mentioned, we don't work alone. Um, having the wildlife vets doing their part for all these diseases on the wildlife side, having the livestock vets doing their part for the livestock side, having public health officials um, doing their part on the human health side, having ecologists and other environmentalists. Um, it's really, I think, personally, for the few years I've been working, everyone's been working in silos, and we really need to start building those bridges and filling up those gaps, because we're all working towards the same goal, just everyone on their own path. Um, but we really need to start working together, and again, with the limited resources everyone has, if we can maximize on what we have and ensure everyone's going towards the same goal together, um, in terms of One Health, everyone, all animals, the environment, everyone's going to be um, in a much better place. It's going to be beneficial to every single person. Um, yeah, I think that's all for me. Perfect. Thank you. Great. So I heard that sort of a useful introduction. I know it's been half an hour, but an introduction to, to sort of a Q&A session um, where you guys can throw questions, ideas at us. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of give a summary at the end with some thoughts of mine, frustrations of mine um, in terms of the wildlife veterinary sector. But yeah, I think in the interest of time, I'll open it up to the floor at this stage um, and just see if there's any immediate questions um, for the panelists. And then, yeah, as I say, we'll do a summary session at the end. Or 
No, I mean, that's really topical. And I know these guys are going to actually give a talk on this this afternoon, but it would be good to touch on it now. And I agree, you know, the rangers are so busy. But just my initial reflections before one of them gives a more detailed response is when, when I go out and speak to rangers, they're really, in, you know, especially where we work in northern Kenya, they're, they're interested in, in animals because they're animal keepers themselves. So as soon as you start talking about animal health, they, they spring up and they're actually interested in it. So I think it would probably make them more engaged in their day-to-day -day jobs, getting them involved with this stuff. But uh, yeah, I'll let one of you guys, as I say, there, there's a whole session on this this afternoon, isn't there? Um, so they'll go into the detail then, but it'd be good to answer that now, Steve or, or Shaleen. Good. Again, thank you very much. And I think, uh, actually I wanted to invite you to that session instead of preempting it here. <laughs> yes, but something is happening, and uh, we realize actually rangers, there are the people out there. They see the animals before even the vets go out there. So why are you denying them that opportunity to help you collect the data? So we have designed that uh, animal health module using the earth ranger. So, and I don't want to preempt, I want to be a little better, keep it so that you can come. Yes, but I think we, we are seeing a very good results, if I might say that. There's another question that you talked about, uh, specific wildlife health people. Did you mean like how we can motivate them? So, I mean, if, if your capacity on the ground is quite low and maybe you don't have a massive ranger unit, do you, have you ever, or is there scope to actually employ people from the community who are basically wildlife health surveillance? You know, you're bringing in a very, sometimes it gets very sensitive in Kenya. And I have seen it when you are talking about the issues of the community and health workers. Let me start from there, even before I talk about the, uh, the wildlife sector. And that has been very emotive for many years. But more importantly, I want to say that uh, just recently, our president actually recognized the role of the community, the people now, not the animal side, health volunteers. And these are people who are going out there to the villages and the communities and helping the government or the medics to collect that data and also try to do kind of first aid. I think in the veterinary sector, we are not doing very well. We still think that uh, there will be a lot of issues. And actually, we have seen that because especially in the rural areas, we ended up having uh, training those community health, uh, animal health volunteers, but they ended up becoming veterinarians. My two colleagues here, they tell me that uh, every pastoralist is a veterinarian, but that has an impact when you're talking about not only the animal welfare, even when you talk about the economics, especially like uh, now everybody is talking about antimicrobial resistance. So to answer you, that is something we have really considered. And I think uh, people are softening. You can see now we are including the rangers to help us collect that data we hopefully in future we can expand that also to the communities. They are, they are already direct lines actually how the communities can report to the rangers or to the moderns and all that data can be fed like for example into the earth ranger. But having said that I think there is a huge opportunity to include them. We are not really training them to become veterinarians but we are all in this one, uh, it's the one health approach. We all, all want us to get that information in good time so that at least uh, we can respond. The other important thing, and I didn't want to <laughs> preempt this talk, is the connection between the lower ground all the way to the, the topmost position in Kenya. So that is happening, uh, but there are many challenges. We don't have enough people to be doing that work in terms of even response. Uh, you, you know, and just two, two things uh, for, from my side is, is one of the frustrations is obviously financing, um, you know, money. Uh, and the second thing that is, is not as much broader than the veterinary world that I found with rangers and communities is, is where does data go and how does it get used? And there's immense frustration in just giving data and then no action. So I think that collecting data, taking it away, not using it is, is a real frustration of communities that we've really got to address um, in many of these areas. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, guys, it's really lovely to find out that we're not the only veterinarians at this uh, Congress, so um, thanks very much for your introduction. Um, my name's Andy Fraser, I'm a private veterinarian that immobilizes between three and 5,000 animals for mostly private landowners and NGO initiatives in South Africa. Um, obviously your guys' work is in, in, in going to be incredibly interesting, I don't know how much of it you've started already. Um, what are you guys measuring? What physiological parameters and metabolites are you going to be measuring? And um, what do you guys envisage is going to be the most important factors, you know, including logistical factors um, in 
in successful translocation, obviously I think as vets we often focus too much on you know, measuring the success or failure of a um, translocation based on mortality, um, but what do you guys will think will be most important in improving the quality of successful translocations? Um, thanks for the question. Um, so what we are focusing um, a lot on at the moment is endocrinology um, on two different uh, aspects. One is the short term and not only endocrinology on the short term and uh, on the longer term is endocrinology. So short term what we really uh, focus on is anesthetic safety, which is, well, you know, it's first very important thing. If you have a bad capture, that's the end. Um, and then we are trying to pilot new techniques. For example, we are using saliva to measure cortisol. Still haven't got any result, so I cannot tell you <laughs> um, if it's a good indicator or not. And then the other pilot we're doing is to use uh, fecal samples collected by the rangers. We're trying to get twice a week. Um, and at the moment, I'm measuring uh, fecal um, glucocorticoids and uh, progesterone for the females to see like, if there is like any abortion or delayed uh, cycles and so on. So we are trying to understand what's the... So connecting all the parts, so from the capture protocols, what's the translocation techniques, for example, hard release or soft release, um, and going uh, up to six months after to understand like what, what's working best. But as I said, it's a pilot. We don't have data yet. Uh, we are still waiting for the first translocation to happen, which is hopefully this month. Um, so hopefully, yeah, next year, we will be able to share more data. But this is what we're doing at the moment. And then these two guys are doing um, diseases, um, which we will combine with the stress levels. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is uh, Lengui and I lead the Leopard Program under San Diego Zoo in Kenya. So I have one question. Um, have you integrated in any way the citizen science and the guides? They are very important in the landscape into monitoring of wildlife and collecting uh, the data that of course can feed into the ranger monitoring uh, data collection in terms of disease. Yeah, I'll let Shalini you can. Thanks for the question. Um, so yes, kind of alluding to the previous question, um, we are currently piloting also, um, we're calling it Earth Ranger Health, though I don't want any problems with using that name until unless it's trademarked, but we shall find out. Um, so yeah, currently it's called Earth Ranger Health, and basically we are going around training the rangers in different conservancies on how to package that wildlife health data. So I. I try to refrain from using the word training them because, again, it's part of their job. They know that um, they always do reports for any wildlife sightings, carcasses that they find, any sick wildlife, any injured wildlife. Um, but yeah, we've tried to standardize um, on the app, still using Earth Ranger, developed a health module to it, and we've currently piloted it at seven sites. We've had trainings with over about 300 rangers, uh, um, and now they are able to continue collecting wildlife health data. Um, in terms of the research as well that we are doing, um, we are also, again, training them in how to collect samples and how, um, of course, to use like the proper gloves and all the proper techniques in sampling um, wildlife, safety included. Um, so yes, we are definitely trying our best to make sure we're not constantly on the ground micromanaging, um, leaving them to do their jobs as they know how to do them. And again, just monitoring with time whatever support they need from us, just making sure that, yeah, we're all working together. Any other questions from there? Uh, you know, so I've got a few questions, um, which I'll ping to a few of them. Um, you know, again, I think working in this space, one of the real frustrations is communication and understanding and learning from guys who are moving thousands of wildlife, you know, a year to, to those of us who 
don't move that many, just mainly because of bureaucracy. Um, but but you know, the, to learn from that sphere would be would be immensely useful. And I, I don't know, you know, I'm I'm sort of a bit disconnected from it because I'm I'm doing other stuff. But Fran and Shalene in particular coming to this quite recently. Um, whether you feel like there there is need for an improved network and communication and sort of knowledge sharing within you know the wildlife vet world and whether this could be a platform to start developing something like that. Um, as I say, I'm a bit disconnected, so there might already be one, but it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on, on how that could be done. Um, definitely. I think with the sciences, with anything like that, we keep learning. I feel like the wildlife field in general is still technically young, and there's so much that there is being done in different countries, and everyone's like at different levels with different things. And definitely it's something important um, that should be done in terms of, again, not everyone working on their own, but sort of having networks where everyone can learn from each other. Because, um, again, Sometimes, like, I know, for example, um, immobilization protocols are different for different species across different countries. And it doesn't necessarily mean one is bad or one is better than the other. They might all be working fine. Um, but yeah, we just need to learn from each other to know, of course, that everyone's doing the best for the animals because that's what's important. And sort of like leave egos and politics and everything aside because at the end of the day, we are all working for the conservation of this wildlife. So yes, definitely. Cool, and uh, another, uh, sorry, sorry, Fran, go for first. I'd like to add um, an experience that was quite shocking for me. Um, I went to a conference last year, it was called First World Conference of Translocation Practitioners uh, in Spain. And there were about 400 people attending, uh, five vets in all the conference. But this is quite normal. Uh, what really shocked me is that I don't know if you're familiar with the word translocation practitioner. Um, it's basically people pushing forward the translocation, and they can have different backgrounds, can be scientists, but more often are more people like more on the political side, let's put it like that. Um, and what really shocked me is that for most people in that room, adding uh, research or scientific people in translocation logistics is a waste of time and it slows down processes. So this was openly said. Um, and I found it, wow, it must be really a veterinarian's fault if we are not able to raise our voice and bring up that the welfare of animals and monitoring the health is actually a pri priority in a translocation and not going to the press saying we moved um, 200 elephants and everything went well, where, whereas it didn't. So, yeah, that's my experience. And I think it's very important that us as veterinarians and scientists in general, we really um, work together and um, raise this uh, lack of also communication. Steve. Yeah, L let me add something to that. In terms of the networks, I think, you know, let me talk about Kenya first. You know, we have uh, most of the veterinarians in Kenya that deal with wildlife. Actually, majority of them happen to be there because they were employed by the Kenya Wildlife Service. And I think that is, uh, has been a big challenge whereby the younger generation that wanting to come into wildlife conservation medicine, that has been actually very restrictive. But uh, I think, as we say, if we don't speak up, nobody will really know what is happening out there. I think now, in terms of the networks, I will also talk about like, uh, we have an association in Kenya called Kenya Veterinary Association. And uh, again, everything that we were discussing there was mainly livestock. And I remember one time, I used to go to the conferences and I was feeling like, I don't think I belong here because my heart was so much into the wildlife area. And later on, we managed to come up with a wildlife uh, branch association. And I think uh, all these are members, which is good, at least, that gives you an opportunity also to network, you know, you know, you share the different experiences and try also to push for the, for, for your, sometimes I don't know what to call it for your rights, but at least those opportunities are out there. I know that uh, Charlene is uh, the current uh, WD, which is a Wildlife Disease Association chairperson. Yes, I used to be in that position before I handed it over. and. Again, this gives us a, a very good uh, opportunity to network with the different people within Africa. More importantly, there is another wildlife group that we had from with the South African. 
And uh, I don't know how it is still happening. So we keep, we start the things and we drop them. I don't know why. Maybe if somebody has an answer how we can really keep that momentum going on. I think the opportunities are there. The government will always be restrictive, and, but we need to raise our voice and uh, push for these uh, opportunities. I know all of you who talked about being uh, wildlife managers. I know sometimes you get frustrated with the veterinarians, even for response. You're calling us for a small case to attend to an animal, but I'm not available. Yes, because I'm working the whole country. It's not that we don't want to do. So you can also help us to push for more veterinarians to act, because you can see they're very fresh graduates and willing to do it, but sometimes we don't see those opportunities. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, a, refle a, ref a reflection. Julian. Hi, Julian, how are you doing? Yeah. A couple of years ago, we were asked by uh, one of our partners out there, we currently work in 19 African countries, and since then we've developed an African wildlife vet course to train young African wildlife vets only um, from 11 countries in the last two years on immobilization and uh, you know, on the ground, hands-on, through the Namibian uh, Veterinary Council that gives temporary registration. Um, and I think the network that those 16 young veterinarians have created from that is exactly what you've just spoken to, Stephen. And I think that's something that you know ourselves and others identified from a, a gap from a giraffe side, but it expands far you know, wider than giraffe. And uh, I think that's something that we need to grow on and uh, support. So it's lovely to hear that you know we're all resonating the same tune. No, Julian, I agree, and I, I'm sure a number of people have been on the Malalangwe course, and I, I did that, and it was the same thing, you know, and if I'm there together, we, you know, you got a connection from that for, with, with a bunch of people all over. So if you could link those somehow and, and sort of, you know, make it exponential, I think it'd be great. Um, I question, yeah, sorry, oh yeah, you guys go first. Closed network um, tourism uh, system. So, like South Africa, especially every protected area is fenced entirely. And then, uh, where we're working, there's a lot of impact of tourism vehicles and both private and um, public vehicles driving through. And how that, especially with your looking into stress post translocation, how does tourism impact that and it does it impact that and have you thought of how you would look into that because I think especially with elephants tourism impact in a, on a stress perspective is very high post translocation no, it's a really good question it's probably not so applicable to Kenya but Fran have you if you've got an answer <laughs> um, no it's a very good point um, I think we will get there we need to get keep things starting uh, it's already a lot like when I wrote this project was three years ago. It was supposed to be a two years project and I put so much into it and I thought, yeah, in two years I'm going to do it. Now it has been the third year, um, still waiting for a translocation. It's, it's a very long process. So I think we need to start from the core, um, which is like the stress itself and then starting to include more information. And once you have a big database, you can go back to trace, you know, what was this, uh, condition like environment, blah blah blah, including tourism. So I think this also thanks to collaborations that are growing is going to be a long-term project, and we will start to add different factors. But yeah, definitely tourism is a big one. You know, one thing to add on that, we we've been looking at these sensors, you know, through these LoRa networks. I'm not sure if people have heard of these LoRa networks uh, to track the basics, you know, pulse, um, activity, um, you know, those kind of things. And, and it's something we're, we are sort of actively looking at at the moment, uh, in these, especially in the sanctuaries, you know, the fence sanctuary areas within Kenya, which I think would give really useful data, but not necessarily tourism related, but it would give you that sort of post translocation data on another level. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I'm Dr. Maria. I just wanted to ask you as well about, um, the translocation guidelines. Um, if you can explore a little bit more, um, are you producing them to your case in a moment with the black rhino, or is it something that you want to make it quite for every species and, yeah, just explore a little bit to that uh, topic? Thank you for the question. Um, so, the idea is the first step will be to create a committee of experts 
um, working in uh, translocation from an animal health point of view and had the very good idea to include in the fund proposal an expert in TOC, which is theory of change. So this will be a learning process. So the idea is to select um, 12 experts, hire a um, theory of change expert to lead conversation over a year, and we will see what will come up. But uh, what I um, envision will be guidelines on what is has to be mandatory to be monitored during a translocation. I think like when translocation, most translocations are organized, they're already very expensive, difficult, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and if there's like no scientific committee or veterinarians pushing for making monitoring mandatory, that is just forgotten. So I think it's not species specific, it's just finding um, approach that can be done easily in the field also hopefully using and having a horse ranger module for translocation so you know the vet the rangers can put information immediately and they're not lost otherwise you know you go home you have them written on a paper and then you have to go for another field work there you know like they, they they just disappear so it's more about the the method not really like guidelines on how to do this in every species it's just more yeah Yeah, quickly, I wanted to add something there, because, uh, you know, with the, we have the IUCN guidelines that all guide us all to this. And uh, she said that not everything is there. And I think the reason is very simple. It's a guideline. It's only to guide you. But what we have seen over time, and uh, we have been, uh, th there's a research that we have been doing in uh, northern Kenya. I talked about the retreated elephants. And one of our scientists and other team, Dr. Shifra Goldenberg, you know, we have come up with very fine observation that we have seen, especially moving elephants, especially if they have been uh, rehabilitated into a new area. And I think that is useful information, which can actually help us improve the different guidelines. I know that is not from the vet side, but at least the more research that we keep doing, the most, it's, it's actually very important actually to put it into the, to bring it forward so that at least they can be incorporated. We have already done that in Kenya. and. Uh, I don't want to say that, uh, you know, I'm from the private sector, and we sit down also with the government and say, okay, this is a guideline that you have, but it's very sketchy, it doesn't have so much information. So what are you guys learning? How can we improve this guideline? So again, it comes back to all of us. Thank you. I think there was one more question, and then we'll wrap it up probably. Hi, my name is Ambrose. I'm also part of Leopard team from San Diego Sioux in Kenya. So. My question is uh, it's about the indig indigenous knowledge that uh, the communities have. In, I know that uh, Chegi just mentioned about how uh, the local community have that knowledge of, you know, like like veterinarian. So how are you as veterinarian uh, incorporating your knowledge as a as a vet, as vet, uh, with the indigenous knowledge that the local communities have? Okay, um, so yes, definitely, as I'd mentioned with the previous project that we've been doing, um, and actually going down to the ground and seeing that communities are very well um, able to, again, with the information that they have, the experience they have, and that indigenous knowledge that they have, um, be able to be the ones who we are sort of like relying on in terms of getting this wildlife health data, um, health data in general, from wildlife or livestock um, in general. So yes, next steps is definitely what we can do. Again, of course, a lot of things are political and there's other members at play that we can't really, we don't have power over. Um, but in the aspects that we can, um, for example, like how we're saying, having the rangers collecting the wildlife health data, is our plan is to involve them as much as we possibly can in any of either the projects or um, surveillance efforts that are being carried out. Because again, they are the ones in the front line, they're the ones with the wildlife um, in the same spaces. So apart from just like us, I believe like across the board, across countries, continents, if, if anything. Um, yeah, it's very important to include the indigenous knowledge and the communities um, in all sorts of health efforts that are being done. Great. Um, any other burning questions? Or should we wrap it up? I'll wrap it up. I, you know, from my sort of reflection, um, 
I, I get excited, I get frustrated, I get worried um, because, you know, especially Africa, the human population growth, the pressure on these natural resources and protected areas, um, the opportunity that's coming through incentives like everyone's, you know, at this conference are, are, are implementing uh, in terms of relocation and repopulation. Uh, it's massive um, and and really evolving, uh, but there's very little known about it, I think, yet. Um, and this is why I think this field is so important, because as we get more pressure with people in livestock and wildlife, the risk of zoonosis, the risk of, the risk of disease press, uh, uh, spread, obviously press and media is massive, um, you know, making, making mess ups if you're doing these big translocations and how that can implement future funding streams. You know, there's so much that we have to protect ourselves against to make sure that we have a positive future for conservation just because wildlife trade, live wildlife trade, the economy of live wildlife trade and genetics, you know, it's all gonna have to come into play. Um, and, and I think that, as I say, it's really exciting, but we have a responsibility as, as a veterinary community uh, to make sure that, you know, like these guys have said, it's done in a productive way, constructive way that's reported so that you can defend yourselves um, and make sure it's ways going forward and then obviously yeah you know financing is a big thing um, somehow we need to get the voice out there that it is critical for the future that we raise money for for, for sort of these these wildlife movements and um, research so yeah if we have a collective voice fingers crossed we can make it positive but yeah thanks to these three for sharing their knowledge and thanks to you guys for being engaging um, I think it was a good session